Welcome to Zeitgeist Radio. I'm your host, Morgan Rowe, founder of the Zeitgeist Academy. Zeitgeist means spirit of the times, and it is the collection of cultural forces that all contribute to what it feels like to be alive and part of a dynamic culture. Every episode, I speak with someone from a unique musical subculture. We dig into their passion and explore how music is a powerful force that brings people together. Before we dive into today's interview, I want to offer you something special. Have you ever considered taking voice lessons but found the prospect of actually approaching a teacher a little terrifying? Well, I have a free self-guided course on how to tell if you have a good voice as well as the four key elements that you can work on to improve your sound. It's a quick and easy way to gain confidence and improve your vocal skills at your own pace. You can sign up for the course at zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio. And again, it's completely free. My guest today is Brooke Trum, a composer and drummer in New York City. All right, Brooke, welcome to Zeitgeist Radio. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, so we worked together at the school um, that I used to run, and you have moved on to bigger and better things in oh, New York. That's, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I've moved as, as of you. <laughs> I feel like over the past year, you've, or actually it's been more than a year. It's been a couple of years. Um, time it's been flies. like three yeah. years, oh my gosh. four years. We worked together like... in 2018, 19, right? Yeah. So three years. Yeah. It's, I've years, almost yeah. been here for four years. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, four or five months. Jeez. I feel like you, you're you such a, in a different place. So how would you describe to people, how would you describe yourself right now? Yeah. I mean, the I think the what it sort of turns into is like multi-hyphenate, like theater artist sort of situation. Like, just like you said, like composer, I'd consider my main thing, but it's, I mean, being a composer is not normally your main source of income. You usually, you know, diversify and do a lot of different things. So like I compose for money when I can, but mostly not because that's how it works. <laughs> sure. Um, I play drums. I haven't had really any percussion opportunities since moving here. I've got to play a lot more drum set, which is fun. And also sad. I don't get to play as much percussion, but I don't have my own set of like timpani or mallets to be like taking to auditions, yeah. even if I wanted to. Um, Actually, can you, before we go on, can you explain, I don't know that everyone who's listening will know the difference mm -hmm. between yeah. drums and percussion. Yeah. So uh, there's tons and tons and tons of people who play drum set. And oftentimes if you're a drummer, you just play drum set, or maybe you play a couple pieces of percussion, like a shaker, or maybe also cajon or tambourine or something like that. But if you're a percussionist, it's sort of built on the three staples of classical snare drum. So similar, somewhat similar to marching snare drum, but like solo snare drum, uh, timpani, which are the huge, like 22 to 26 or 31 inch, like steel drums, or sometimes they're 10, I believe. Um, and then mallet instruments being like marimba, xylophone, glockenspiel or bells, um, and vibraphone. And Amongst all of those things, there's other like auxiliary percussion instruments like tambourine and like shaker and like crash cymbals or other things that you end up playing also. But someone who's trained in drum set or learns how to play drum set might not be trained in percussion as well. It's just like if you're an electric bass player, you might not play upright bass. They're, they're separate disciplines that lend to each other for sure, but not every, not each one is also the other thing. <laughs> yeah. They're separate. Sometimes it's both. Do you have a preference or do you just like it all? I I like all of it. I think I, in college and undergrad, I really like took a four year break from playing drum set where that's like what I would have considered my main thing. And so I think then in college, I mostly played, like I felt like timpani was my strongest thing, but I had to play everything and I enjoyed playing everything. And I liked getting to be able to play all types of percussion instruments. I really liked hand drums. I really enjoyed playing like djembe bongos and congas. And I got to play like some other like samba percussion, like a cuica or sometimes a kaicha, but I didn't get to play that as much. A kaicha is like a snare drum. It's very similar. It's like a side song and a lot smaller. Um, But I'm also like by no means an expert on that kind of percussion <laughs> either. I'm I'm definitely more in the span of classical percussion. Um. But then, I mean, moving here and also just being out of school, 
you get less opportunities to play percussion. And I've done it a little bit. And thankfully with like theater drumming, which I'm trying to do more of when those gigs come through, uh, there's a little more combination of the two. Like a theater drum set player is asked to play some percussion. And sometimes if it's like a big pit <laughs> for theater, a show will have a drum set player and a percussionist. And that drum set player will still play percussion instruments in their setup and they just have a crazy setup versus the percussionist who just has a million different things that they're doing in their section and in their part. So I get to use both the percussion and drum set playing in theater music, which I really enjoy doing. I like being able to combine them where I can. I think before college, I might have like when I was in high school, you know, playing, (laughs) playing percussion and band but and playing drum set like for fun mostly yeah I would have maybe preferred drum set but I think at this point like because I can do all of it to a, you know a decent level I like to try and combine them when I can and so I had I I just played for Dolly Parton's show 9 to 5 at Pace University Sweet. which was super fun and my roommate music directed it that's how I got the job Connections is always the thing. (laughs) Um, But I got to, I think I just added like triangle and wind chimes. And that was like the little bit of extra percussion. I was like, any little bit I get to play triangle (laughs) is the best part. Do you have all that stuff or do they provide that? Like, or I I had a triangle. I did not have wind chimes. And so I I bought a set um, with like half intent to return but if I liked it I would have kept it and I did not like it so I <laughs> returned it but it's you know all all instruments are expensive and and yeah. small piece of percussion are no you know exception to that rule so I'll I'll buy a nice one when when I find one that I like and want to invest in it but I do have like a collection of percussion instruments and mallets as well I only have some of them here in New York and pretty much every time I fly back home I bring us another piece back <laughs> Because I just have like a huge, like probably like 20, 30 pound percussion bag back in Oregon that I've just slowly brought here. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like hauling all that stuff to gigs? I don't actually normally have to haul a ton because a lot of places that I play like for drum set um, have a house kit already. So it is assumed that you bring cymbals. So I have my own set of cymbals here and those are kind of heavy. Um especially if you're like walking up and down the subway stairs like you are. I have like a little bit of asthma. So there's like certain venues that I'll trek to and I'll be like, I know this one sucks. Oh no. <laughs> Just with the cymbals on my back. And now I, I got like a new bass drum pedal that I really prefer to use. So I've been taking that as well. So the only time I've like asked an artist or if it's like a show to provide like transportation costs, which sometimes they will. Uh, is if I'm more than my backpack of symbols and two hands. There you go. <laughs> so like some places you have to bring a kick pedal and a snare drum. I think there was only one gig I went to where it also wanted me to bring a drum throne. And I just like got the info of one of the other drummers that was playing at that gig and was like, hey, do you want to share something? Like drum throne, I by the way. All of this. Yeah. <laughs> drum throne, by the way, is I think my favorite. Um, it just means the seat, people. Yeah. It just means the seat. <laughs> Yeah. it's a throne Drummers call it the throne and i think that is so excellent. royalty <laughs> so great oh awesome how many gigs have you been doing with this the theater the theater um percussion um i haven't had too many i think most of it has been the the nine to five show was the only one i've done like through like a proper institution Sure. All the other ones I've done have been for friends musicals that they'll do showcases or um, performances of. So like uh, two friends of mine, Alex Becker and Kat Cardicello, who I went to grad school with for writing musical theater, they had their thesis show performed in three different places now. And I played for it each time. And that's been super fun. Nice. So they did one production at NYU, which was in our old like black box we had classes in. <laughs> Um, and that was like four performances, I think. And I also like hopped in four days before opening night with the music for the first time. It was like, okay, let's <laughs> let's go, let's put it together. <laughs> it was a shorter show, which was nice in that capacity. But then, like the next time I played it was they did a showcase of it at Fifty Four Below, which was super fun. And I was just flying back from Oregon a week before, and oh, so boy. I was like, I've played it once. I'll just refresh <laughs> it. 
and that happened to be the case again this last year when I got back from San Diego, they were doing it at the Scranton Fringe Festival in Pennsylvania. And so I hopped in on two rehearsals and then went to Pennsylvania with them with my drums to to do it. Wow. And tell me about the San Diego project, because um, I, I knew that you were involved somehow. What was this project and, and how what was your part in it? Yeah. So the the show is called Come Fall in Love and is an adaptation of a Bollywood movie. It is called DDL, DDLJ is the shortened version of the name of it. It opened in opened. It was in theaters for the first time in 1995, I believe, and it has stayed in theaters since. It's not actually like left. It is like one of the most popular, if not the most popular Bollywood movie of all time. And so I'll I'll get to my role on it. I'll just talk about the show a tiny yeah, bit. Yeah, please. Um, it is uh, it is being made by um, the film studio that originally made the movie and the director for the musical is the writer and director from the movie from back then and so he is fully putting this project forward which is super cool with his own money and then he has like the composers on the project there's two composers who are um the team is called Vishal and Shaker and they are like two massively massively famous composers and like rock stars in India and they're both like super awesome people and their music is very very fun so it like certainly works well for a Broadway stage and then they brought on um, Nell Benjamin to the project, who was the, I think, just the lyricist for the Legally Blonde musical. And then I think also just the lyricist for the Mean Girls musical. Wow. And she is fantastic. And she is Broadway celebrity, right? Like, right. <laughs> they really like the, the various people that they gathered are tons of people from the film industry in India and from Broadway here. Um, and my role in it is one of the smallest roles that doesn't make it unimportant. No. I, can, I can get into that in more detail. But my the title of my role was music assistant. It's not an assistant job. I'm not like getting coffee for people, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is a, a mistitling of the role. And the one of the ways it's often underpaid and underappreciated. It is also the not only non-union job on a show. So there's things that need to be happening with it. And there's there's a whole thing about music assistants trying to fight for their own you know, better pay and yeah. rights and whatnot. But the essential, like, basic outline of a music assistant role, which was what I did, I didn't do too much beyond that. I did a little bit beyond that, and I can get into that as well, is that you are in charge of all of the changes happening to the piano vocal score. So, like, what the pianist in rehearsals is playing and what the vocalists are singing so like one of the composers might like say like no i want this melody to change to this and i have to live transcribe it and change it in the music and then keep a list of all the changes i've done every day reprint new music for those people that need that change <laughs> gotcha no pressure yeah right and so i like i have daily lists of changes that that you make to the score so you can track back and be like where was that old one from? And I can pull the exact date of the score from an old file and find that change that we made. And so then there's also like a running list of every change you've ever made for the whole span of whatever the project is. Wow. <laughs> In San Diego, it was two months. I did a month long workshop with them in like March and April before that summer. So around this time last year, I was doing the month long workshop for them and had a list of changes from that workshop. And, you know, daily scores that are saved there's so many finale files <laughs> finale is just software that you you use to notate music on a computer so i literally was just sitting there with my computer all day and like live transcribing changes or getting lists from like script changes and lyric changes to apply and i'm essentially sitting just right next to the music director and or the composers all day man that must have been incredible it's really fun. <laughs> yeah. And it's obviously great when you have a good team. And this this project has a really like lovely team of people on it. Um, but it's, it's what certainly is the purpose? Like not a low pressure job. It is very much a high pressure job that is not entry level. You need a lot of education to be able to do it. For sure. And I think that's the, the difficult part because it is very much treated like an entry level job in Broadway because it is the lowest sort of rung on the music team. 
Yeah. But that does um, not make it unimportant as you. <laughs> no. What is a the sense um, of what the, what the role is? What is why? Where do they keep or why do they keep every single revision? Do they ever like do they actually refer back to those? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Because we're talking about like you might cut like fully cut out of a score like oh. six bars and what if there's a change in the choreography and you need those six bars back then you put them back like gotcha you also never actually change measure numbers as you're working through you have to maintain the same measure numbers if measures are cut or added how do you do that <laughs> for cut ones you just write a jump in it so it's like 23 to 60 oh man and you don't have <laughs> cohesive numbers and then if you're adding bars you get like 60 a b c d e whatever as it keeps going wow um, and i think there's there's only there were only a couple instances in the two months for that uh, workshop and show that i like re numbered things which is like kind of a, a no-no but i it was a discussion with like me and the orchestrator and the composers making sure we were all on the same page and like before we sent it to the copyist which is a totally separate job um which i did do a little bit of work sort of in that sphere as well when and a copyist um uh, i also have have training in that and i'm sort of working towards a bit more of that kind of work now on top of everything um but that is like you prepare the final like physical scores that the composer not composer the conductor keyboard player and instrumentalist will read and so when changes then happen to those parts that have already been physically made and shipped right <laughs> to wherever they're going uh you have to then cut out the new parts and put them physically in their scores you don't reprint for them and that is copy work job because it's related to the instruments not the piano vocal but I did have to do some of that in San Diego as well. But that is not normally a music assistant job. Right. Oh, man, I feel like there's so many li little ends of Broadway that I have no idea. <laughs> just like, and, and originally, too, what I was like, I mean, I'm still very early in my like, yeah. experience in it. It takes, it takes decades for people to like get anywhere. Yeah. Um, so like initially, also as a composer, my understanding when I when hearing about like oh there's a different composer orchestrator vocal arranger you know copyist all of the different roles that you have not even knowing that music assistant was a job obviously right before I was like well I can do all those things why don't I quote unquote can do all those things um why wouldn't the composer just orchestrate and do everything uh there's no time <laughs> Sure. Things just go up so fast and sure. changes happen so fast that you like really want to be able to focus on your one task and it would actually be impossible for you to try and even do two of the roles, nonetheless, like four or five of them that, that exist. Um, wow. So, there's so some, things there's that some, you would normally just be able to jump in and do. It's just how, someone else's yeah, job. That's else. the thing. Yeah. Nice. And I mean, there are you work with them very closely. So obviously, if they're doing something you don't like with your music then you change it but there's there's certainly a process about it and you don't orchestrate too soon because changes happen so often like you want the core of the songs to be pretty dang conk before you orchestrate anything which then also means your orchestrator has to be speedy they have to be yeah. really fast <laughs> typically is it written then just on piano and then the orchestration how would you i guess i never considered that being separate like how would Right. The we'll orchestrator the know. Doing it. <laughs> yeah. How would they know what they want? Yeah. It's a lot of times it's like, to my understanding, sometimes it's the orchestrator sort of going crazy because they've like going crazy in the best way of like they see what's in the piano part and what's in the vocal line and really just like do their thing and explode it into all the different parts. But like, I mean, that would be when there's more like interpretation, that might be more of a case of like someone like Jonathan Tunick who does sondheim's orchestrations that he is like famous for his orchestrating <laughs> and i forever thought sondheim did all of his orchestra yeah because it just sounds like his music because it is and jonathan tunic just does an excellent job of still making it sound like sondheim but adding so much to it and like you have to know what the themes are in your show you have to make dramatic decisions just like you do as a composer or as one of the writers like you have to know the show inside and out and in at least these processes, the few that I've been in, 
where you're there when it's happening. The orchestrator is present for all of this far before they start writing. And so they can have discussions with the composer or composers about what they want, what kind of mm-hmm. oh, what kind of instrumentation first is important. They'll know of course. that pretty quickly. Um, but it's it's a lot of like you are so seeped in the music that you can get a sense of like what should go where pretty quickly. Um, and also like some composers will make demos and then you can go off of that too versus like something that has no information and then you are really putting more into it but yeah wow it's it's very fun i like i'm (laughs) because i also like to orchestrate i am working on loosely working on orchestrating one of my friend's shows and i've talked with um my friend earl who's the composer for for that show about like you talk about instrumentation and then it's a lot of like as I'm starting to put sketches together for it, I send it to him to make sure I'm going in the right direction. But like, I get plenty of information from the piano part. And like, I know what he's going for. I know the music from the show pretty dang well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I've also played for it for they did a they did a version of it at 54 Below also, and I got to play drums for it. And he's a good orchestrator, too. He has some versions of the songs that are orchestrated, but it's sort of like the ones that aren't orchestrated, I'm like. How how much do you want me to just like go? <laughs> right. Because if you want me to just like drive it home, because I can usually get like the direction that he's going with things. Because, you know, when it's only in a piano part, you have to make the piano do so much work. Right. Which once you actually orchestrate it, it doesn't have to do that anymore, which is the best part. Yeah. So it helps to have a composer that is really good at writing those piano parts with all the information it needs to have. And I've like... Um, I imagine for them to, for certain people, it's probably a huge relief to have someone who specializes in like, and also, I mean, my, my mom played in um, symphonies forever and she has, she plays French horn and she has so much respect for a composer. She always talks about composers who understand the, the true natural sound of, for example, the horn. Right. And, you know, it's, it's place in the orchestra. Yeah. And that's all like, I mean, I'm still forever learning (laughs) yeah about all of that and I feel like I have like certain instruments that I have a pretty good understanding of, and other ones where I'm just like I'm just going to sit down with the player as I'm working on this part and so that way whenever anyone else reads it in the future I don't have to worry about it and I know it works for that instrument because I've talked to the player that can look through it with me Mm -hmm. and I literally just did that today (laughs) for one of my songs that I'm trying to get recorded because I nice. like I did a guitar capo thing wrong, which of course, yeah, guitar is incredibly hard to to put together if you don't write for it. I feel like all I have to have an understanding of all the instruments, but it, to me, it seems like guitar and drums are somehow the hardest one to write for if you don't play them. Ah, that's interesting because so many people do play guitar. I'm surprised that's on that list. It's like, well, that's that's in in me thinking about it. I know drums and percussion are on that list from just talking to any other writers mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. where I'll meet them and they'll be like, can you help me with like drum parts? And I'm like, that is my literal mission in life. <laughs> yes, I will, I will help you write better drum parts and percussion parts. There is a way to do it that's not awful. And so much of the time it's awful. <laughs> I love it. What makes it awful? There's there's not quite it's pretty close now i have a like a concrete opinion about it but it's not quite as standardized as other instruments because it's a newer instrument like newer is in the last 120 30 years (laughs) that people are actually making music for it making solos for it and especially like drum set yeah i'm talking solos that's like snare drum and or timpani that's earlier than that same thing with like Saxophone is standardized, but it's also a newer instrument. It is newer, yeah. All the, all the solo material for it is is within the last hundred years or so. So all the other instruments, there's tons of like repertoire and research and things you can find on how to write for them effectively and what sounds really good in them and what is a bad example of it. But with drums, you can look for like a key and I know what good drum music looks like because I've read it forever. But like a lot of drummers don't read music. Yeah, like, a lot of them learn by ear, and there's a lot of people now that are making their drum parts on a DAW or like on Logic or Pro Tools or something. And those are computer programs. Yes, <laughs> DAW is Digital Audio Workstation. Uh that 
they just throw some drum programming in and then expect a real drummer to play it. Sure. So, and it's, it's people that actually like make the effort to talk to a drummer and work through it with them to be like, is this playable? Like, not only is it like playable, is it effective? Like, and I, I love talking about that with friends of mine who I've helped with drum parts over the years mm -hmm. and just talking about like, okay, you know what it's supposed to look like now. <laughs> I can trust you to put everything in the right place and I'll be able to read it. But is it doing what you want it to do in this moment as an instrument? Yeah. And there's like just a million different things you can do with drums. You can make it. I mean, obviously beats. That's like the first thing you would do with drums. But like you got to throw fills in there somewhere. And sometimes it's treated more like a progression instrument with like textures and a little less like a drum set. And like, when is it time to put certain kinds of beats in there? And when is it time to like not let that happen quite yet because once you're in it you're like a little stuck unless you fully just like flop the other way <laughs> and switch styles dramatically in the song and there's like so many small details of like level building with drums because there there's such a powerful thing to add to something yes whether you don't have it or you have it <laughs> yes and i know this from playing i mean on obviously not in a theater sense but from playing with you we've performed mm -hmm together yeah. um and in such we were in such a small ensemble it was we were in a piano small and drums and vocals mm -hmm. so any drums i added was like whoa there's drums now <laughs> right because but even the like... tiniest little amount it added so much but it also like you said like could be very overwhelming uh, or just completely change the the entire feel i mean it's yep. it's the beat it's the groove <laughs> if you if you change grooves then you're out of the groove i don't know <laughs> Do you like my technical explanation? You can just tell your friends that. Change grooves, you're out of the groove, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah, you're out of the groove. You can't change the groove in the middle of the song. <laughs> yeah, it just depends how. Yeah. So then if you're playing these theater productions that have um, like sets in them, are you playing, are these like rock musicals or what style is, are you typically playing? So, so far what I've been playing is mostly rock based. There's a lot more like pop rock musicals happening and and being played that i understand mm -hmm. i also like am not the person to call if you're wanting a player for a jazz musical or like certain other genres i'm very much like more comfortable in the rock pop genre um just because that's my playing background and i can play a little bit of jazz if i'm asked of it like in nine to five there was like one one and a half jazzy songs where i'm like okay I can I can put this together, but I'm gonna have to practice it more than the other songs because I can't I can't just read it because it's not notated because jazz drums aren't fully notated. I have to do a lot of assuming or listening to the recordings that already exist of the songs. But I think it really depends on the kind of show. I've had a couple of friends write uh, a little more folky like cool songs or like mm -hmm. singer songwriter based ones, which are also happening, which then leads to a little more creative playing which is, I would think of it as like more texture based rather than group based. Sure. People come to me all the time asking if I can help them figure out if they have a good voice. In fact, I get asked that so much, I made a mini course you can take yourself to help figure out what good means to you, identify your strengths in your voice and find the areas you can work on to make your voice even better. Head over to zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio for free access. That's Z-E-I-T-G-E-I-S-T academy.com slash radio. Uh, so switching over to composing just for a little bit, um, what are some projects that you've done that are fun? Oh my gosh. I um, still have the, the movie musical that I worked on in grad school. I haven't done a ton of work on it recently just because, you know, it's amount that we are submitting to people is like the script and three songs and we have those nice <laughs> so other other work will happen when i have free time and or motivation or uh we have someone that wants to hear more of it and then i'll work on more of it where are you submitting it so at the moment it's like mostly screenplay competitions and it's it's hard to get traction for especially because my collaborator and i are not um in the film world as much we were very much in the musical theater world and we chose to do this movie instead of a stage musical for our 
thesis in grad school specifically because we knew we would need more help with it. So I think we got that help and I think it was was a smart idea. But again, it now we're left with nothing to submit to anything because we don't have a full stage show we've written together. And the Man, stage show, catch the, 22 written, right there. You know, that's the that's the pr- problem I'm exactly in right now. And I will be for the next several years as I'm working on the current stage show we're working on. Um, but the other two, I guess like one and a half shows I've written, I don't want to take anywhere. They really feel very much like they were practice and that I learned a lot from them. And it really feels like Pandora Rocks, the movie musical, was the first project where I, I'm like, okay, here's the first proper <laughs> thing I've written if I'm thinking of like my catalog as a writer that I am trying to share with people. Yeah. And then this, um, that idea is so fun. Can you, can you describe Pandora rocks real quick? Of course. Yeah. So it is meant to be like a, a family friendly animated musical, um, preferably 2d, but I mean, <laughs> whatever gets funding I will do. <laughs> um, and it is essentially, uh, based off of the Pandora, Pandora's box, Greek myth. Uh, where instead of the story ending when the box opens and she's sort of punished for the sins of the world, uh, she chooses to fight back and put the evils back in the box. And in this case, in the show, it's with like a battle base, sort of like Scott Pilgrim-esque style fighting with musical instruments. Uh, Very rock heavy score. I wanted the score to sound like rock music, not like theater rock. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Which is a big, big part of why it was fun for me. And also why I orchestrated along the way, which is has its own challenges. But I can't write a hard rock score on a piano. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not how it works. <laughs> um, but the but the show itself uh, has very much like a critique of sort of family relationships and when they are working and when they are not, and the theme of chosen family. So like in the show. Um, it's sort of like Pandora is a demigod situation where her father is Zeus and she has a human mother named Pyrrha. And uh, it's very clear as you sort of like <laughs> get into the show that Zeus maybe hasn't been the best father. And yeah. then he, um, then Pandora for for disobeying him by stealing his lightning to make her battle base uh, punishes her with the box. And then as she spends her time trying to prove herself, thinking that this will prove herself to her father by being able to fight these, you know, beings that are much more powerful than her. uh, It really is exactly the opposite of what he wants to be happening because he just wants to teach her a lesson um, that she doesn't want to learn because it's not a lesson for her to be learned. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) And it sort of gets uh, to the point, at least near the end of it, I don't want to spoil it too much, but of like um, the whole time she's she's wanted to be like a god, like a full fledged god and proof to her father that she can be powerful like him and that she deserves a place with him. Um, and eventually she comes to the point of like, if this is what a god looks like, I don't think I want to be like that. And then she chooses to be like her mother. I love it. It's very and I do say so myself. I'm very lucky to have heard. <laughs> early drafts of it and well actually i think you sent me some later files too they're it's very good <laughs> it's, the pieces i've seen are very good i'll have to, I'll have to say i really the, hope it goes somewhere script yeah i the that's that's one fun thing though about like anytime you share your work with people is like with pandora we've gotten a lot of really positive like reactions from people and not even like like sharing the material after we share the material we do too but like just sharing the concept like i am right now i've had a lot of people get really excited about it which makes me happy because i feel like we've written something really fun and special and something that can be enjoyable for all ages which was a big thing for us um and like i think that the music is is super fun and i would have loved to hear more music like this when i was younger and I mean, I did I did grow up hearing like a lot of classic rock and I loved that. Um, but I think like some of the like one of the songs is based off of like uh, Animals by Muse. And like there's a song that's based off of Lazaretto by Jack White. And it's like 
very groove heavy like hard rock that's super fun and that the the genre really like is meant to really add to and emulate battles that are going on between pandora and these evils that she's fighting who did you write this with and what is their role versus your role Mm -hmm. so the person i wrote this with his name is carrie kasmarovich trim very long last name trim and trump i know exactly (laughs) when i met when i met him he was like what is the origin of your last name because it sounds like one of mine (laughs) amazing and we're both blonde with blue eyes so we're like this is suspicious (laughs) (laughs) um but he's fantastic i'm also writing the stage show we're currently working with him he writes the book and lyrics for it and i write the music and we work on the story and outline and you know brainstorm scenes and everything together so it's fun very much like being a part of the whole thing even though i'm not writing any words <laughs> right so this is something that i learned uh when you went to college or grad school which was fascinating to me is not everyone who goes to what i would consider grad school for music writes music uh so the the program is not a music program okay that would explain it then it. yeah <laughs> i thought so, you like, were going I to have, grad school I for have, music yeah, I I was. I wrote music and only music for this grad program, but it was okay. an arts program. So okay. my, my degree is technically an arts degree. It's Master of Arts. It's not a music one like I did in undergrad. Okay. And so in I went to the NYU grad, graduate musical theater writing program. Goodness, it's a big thing to say. Highly recommend if you if you can get enough scholarship like I did to be able to go. Um you have great professors and it's a fantastic two-year program where you just get to write and write and write and learn from a lot of trial and error and really like ingrains in collaboration and the process that writing is rewriting and especially if you're like me who came from classical composing mostly like pieces aren't done really they're just left (laughs) like that you can always go back and change a piece if you want to and it's done sort of when you decide it is and it doesn't have to be this thing of like now it's finished I'll never touch it again and it's like Mm -hmm. perfect or not perfect it's done and I'm not going to touch it and I'll just go out to perform it you could change things whenever you want to change them that's an active part of musical theater and it can be part of any other writing practice but I was very much previously under the impression if you finish it it's done you never touch it again right (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I mean, the whole music assistant position is based off the idea that it's never exactly, done. that it, it changes over and over again. Yeah. And for, for Come Fall in Love, I literally up to my last 30 minutes of work was was fixing things. <laughs> I like 30. Is that 30 minutes before what? <laughs> like, is it like before curtain my time day was done like... before opening night? Before opening night. They're making changes that late. It depends on the show. This one, they were. <laughs> I literally wow. was like, I I had like four hours and I was like, okay, I have all of this to do before I am officially done working for this project. And I fly back to New York and I somehow scrambled it in just barely, like in the last <laughs> minutes, I was like, okay, I, I finished it somehow. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Okay. So back to your project. So what is your process? You submit to these uh, competitions. And then what happens if someone picks them up? Like, what what does that even look like? Do you have any idea? I I don't quite know. I have a lot less experience in it than than my collaborator does. Carrie, thankfully, has done and does work in TV and film as well as in theater. Mm-hmm. Most of his work is in theater, but he, like, I don't think we would have chosen to even write a script if neither of us had any experience in it. So he he definitely led the way more with, like, creating a pitch deck for it so that that is what we send to people if anyone has any interest in it um and we did have a lovely call with a studio at one point to get thoughts on it and that was super helpful in part to actually talk with some people about it like some actual industry people but also to get a sense of like okay is our is our pitch deck accurately reflecting what we want it to be reflecting sure if someone sees that and then reads the script they're one cohesive message and it can really add to what they're getting yeah Um, but that that was one one big part of it that we just 
is not something that exists for theater. You don't make a make a pitch deck like you do for movies or for TV shows. Do you um, know how do you get uh, what's the process for getting a show produced, a, a theater show? Um, so unless you already have money, <laughs> right. which is always the, the big piece of it is is getting it produced is finding someone who will spend the money to get a workshop happening and then a production happening. So my understanding of the process for that is you write the show, you you also submit it to many things, you usually have to write the whole thing. Um, there are a lot, a surprising number of things you can submit for, for musical theater, and you can submit individual songs, you could submit the whole show, you can submit an outline if you don't have the whole thing written to do like uh, a writer's retreat or be in programs that you can collaborate more actively or be in talks with people because they like your work and as you're still working on it. Um, but the biggest thing that you can do if you have a show is try and get traction for it. So that is either some people make content on TikTok, <laughs> which I don't oh, okay. have a very hard time doing. I I don't know if I'll ever be able to get myself to do that. <laughs> um, and getting like workshops of it, which usually costs money. Also, you trying to get get college performances of your work done a little more easily. Sure. Um, but the first little bit is is someone has to show interest in it. And then the more record of interest you have as you send it to things or people, um, the more likely it is that you'll be able to get funding to start to do a workshop. So you get a developmental workshop. Sometimes there are weeks, sometimes there are two. If you have a lot more money, it's like a month. Um, and then in that time, you have actors and a music director and sometimes a music assistant where you put the work together and teach it so that you can actually hear actors do it all the way through by the sure. end of the week. And that just teaches you a lot about the piece to then make more edits. <laughs> so like, even with Come Fall in Love, um, there's now been a production in San Diego. There's a ton of edits that, that are going to happen after that uh, before it goes to another production. So wow. even if shows have had a production, changes are still going to be happening because you got to watch that happen and have thoughts about it in its exact process. And it is almost impossible to get a sense of how the whole show works and if it feels right if you don't see it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, it's and like it's how comedians just see it. <laughs> it's exactly. like how comedians just tell jokes, you know, tell jokes and jokes and jokes and jokes and jokes, and then maybe one of them will land. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Huh. And with 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 a musical, like that's why it takes people just like years and years and years to write them, yeah. because you edit one thing that changes this and this and this and this, and it's all very quickly a domino effect. And sometimes it's a positive one. Sometimes you have to throw out whole chunks of the show, and sometimes that's just what happens. <laughs> I, I don't think Carrie and I threw out, I think we maybe threw out like two songs, two or three songs that we wrote for the show. But like some of our friends during like writing their thesis shows throughout like six or seven mm. or more songs or like half of their show. Like as you write more and as you make changes, things just don't work anymore. Yeah. And like, well, this was fun. I learned from it, but now it's not going to ever be seen by anyone. And that's fine because it wasn't working for the show. But, yeah. You have to be disconnected because yeah. otherwise like the emotional like no but i poured my heart and soul into exactly. you can't put your heart you and soul into it. yeah you can pour your heart and soul into it but you can't let that affect what's right best for you can pour show. your heart and soul into the project but not an individual piece oh my gosh <laughs> and i mean with with pandora carrie and i had a song that was meant to be the third song in the show um no second song in the show called let in some light when she puts the lightning into the bass and makes it. Um, and we had to throw, we did five versions of the song and we threw it away because the second we wrote the opening, it ah. achieved what we emotionally needed to achieve for the character. And then we didn't need that moment anymore. Although, Descri it, it what does that fun... feel like when you like make that connection? <laughs> um, I think, I think at the time for, for me and Carrie, it was a little relieving because we had done five drafts of it already. And the last like two we were just like scraping we we're just like i don't know what the song is anymore um because we're just like we don't know what it's doing for the character it's it's not moving anything along we know all of this already but it's such a cool moment to possibly have a song that i think that's why we held on for it for too long 
Um, and that's tricky too, because when you're approaching a subject like in ours was based off of Greek myth, but largely original and largely had a lot of world building around, them, there could have been a million moments that you could have made it into a song moment. And that would have been a cool one. And unfortunately, we didn't need it anymore because Pandora got her, her sort of like, I I want, quote unquote, I want song out of the way in the opening. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't need that for her until it changed, which is when the box opened. And that's when you get the Pandora Rock song, which is her new path that you get. And you get that in that song. Well, maybe in like 20 years, you'll be writing a completely different show and you'll be like, wait a second, that's the one. Yeah. No, yeah. I'll just, I I was also, <laughs> oh my gosh, I was so proud of the music for that song too, because I like ripped the riff from Thunderstruck by ACDC Sweet. and like rearranged it around and so that it was based on that. And I had been doing work like that. In oh, because it's thunder, it's lightning. That, oh yeah. my gosh. I was trying to pull <laughs> pull from other other like material, not not anywhere close to be like recognizable, but I could be like, hey, here's these notes in the Thunderstruck line. And I put them all together and then built it around that. Like it was stuff like that. And so I was sad that I had to throw that away because that was really fun making it. And it was also, I think, the third song we wrote for the show, third or fourth song. And so it was was hard to let go of because yeah. it was it was so early in the process. But it was very clear that it just like was not working anymore, unfortunately. But I thought it was the hardest one to throw away because we had done so many versions of it. We had like rewritten it for like a week's worth of work each time, five times. <laughs> oh, and we've done about that same amount of rewrites for Pandora Rocks also. We had we had rewritten it four or five times. And then like uh, Joy After Death, which is the second song we wrote, which is later in the show. That song we left almost entirely the same from the first draft until we did like a tiny revision for the second draft and same thing with the disease battle song which is the first evil that she fights but that one was like exactly the same as we first wrote it and then after grad school we did like one tweak <laughs> nice how do you so decide sometimes, what sometimes you're gonna you write, write about? it and just like, in how, general how do you decide yeah there's so many like how do you decide what you're gonna write about for a musical or in a show i guess either one i'm picturing like I don't know, like all of these, the, I was picturing within Pandora, like there's, there's obvious points on the journey, but you know, how do you choose which one gets a song or yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it with, um, at least Carrie and I, and those moments can change and you can find that you needed a song somewhere where you didn't think you knew where one would work, which did happen for us. And I can talk about that, but both for Pandora and for the, the other show we're doing, we did a very detailed outline <laughs> for a long nice. time nice. and explored, before we wrote anything, explored possible song moments and sort of looked at what that would look like, what it would accomplish, who would be singing it, like it, who would be singing it to whom, for what reason, all of the, all of the details. And um, one of the spots that we didn't originally want a song and had several drafts of the show without a song there was when she opens the box and now there's a song there <laughs> of, of the evil singing when they come out of the box and it oh, ended sure. up being perfect and super fun but initially we were, we just could not figure out how to musicalize it and i think that was one of the last songs we wrote for the show was that one and then like the very ending song which we had done like three three or four different fully different songs for <laughs> wow so how do you get to Broadway, Brooke? Like <laughs> money, Morgan. Okay. <laughs> that is unfortunately the answer. I see. Um, yeah, it's it's really if you're if you're someone like me or like any of my friends who are all all writing because they have an affinity for it and went to school for it and really enjoy it, it's very much an uphill slog. And it's a matter yeah. of working on a project that you are passionate about, a show that you really like the the phrase is write what you know so write something from your own experience so that you can put yourself into um and really the like best musical theater writers are people who really took pieces of themselves and like put that into their shows so if you write a show that you think is properly good that you think you've put yourself into and you really really believe in the best thing that you can do is make other people believe in it 
and that comes from showing it wherever you can whether mm -hmm. it's you know on tiktok <laughs> or at different showcases or concerts um getting connections from other friends if they know anybody who might be interested in it or like um just again trying to build momentum for it in any way like the same the same things that lead to workshops that lead to small productions lead to big productions it's all about traction and it's all about making more people know about the show and more people interested in it so that you then can get investors and that is the the hardest part is just getting investors <laughs> right so man networking crazy networking yeah and it is it is so so much of theater as i'm learning more and more about it and working in is all connections like there's nothing you hardly nothing you can apply to as far as like things that will get you any consistent work mm -hmm. i think the only things that i know of that you can apply to as like a writer are like the disney or dreamworks uh, sort of show incubator things that they do where they hire writers to write ips of their shows for like cruise ships and stuff right um, so like one of my professors wrote like a Finding Nemo musical. She was the lyricist for it because she did one of those programs because she had had success for some other work and then wanted to do that or they reached out to her. And so she did that. And there's like other professors of mine who have had success in other facets with their writing. So then they can write musical theater <laughs> because they have uh, more of their pay covered from royalties from said other popular sure. project. So again, diversifying, <laughs> writing for different things that you can. Um, there's a lot of um, ways in from like writing kids musicals, like um, the Finding Nemo show, or even like my my collaborator Carrie. He works. I don't remember what the what the company is called, but he works for a company that that out like children's musicals to be done by like children's theaters or middle schools yeah. um and he's had like hundreds of productions of his shows because of that because he's 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 first of all a good writer like <laughs> i will hype him up all day he's absolutely fantastic nice and knows exactly like what to do in whatever context whether it's for very little kids or for you know adults or whatever it might be um but you know there's there's avenues in and all of it is about not just getting like traction for your piece, but sometimes the, a piece you've written might be the reason someone's interested in you as a writer. And maybe they'll ask you to write something, something else, or, else. Your, or your team to write something else. So like it's super possible to, to hop on a call with somebody with a project that you want to happen. And they'll be like, this isn't quite for us, but we think we like your writing as a team and then reach out to you another time. So that's the and another another way that you can start to get into it. There's a lot of avenues, but a lot of it is just like outlasting <laughs> and always writing and just trying to to keep yourself present in what you're doing. And you know, there's like a lot of people considered to be like upcoming theater writers to like look out for are in their like late thirties and forties. Like it's very rare for someone my age to have like a big break. And like the most recent example of that is probably the writers of six. They're around my age and they're, they got the Tony for best score last year. Like, <laughs> and it deserved it. Six is great. It's super fun. The music is like the most modern music on Broadway. And like what maybe the last youngest person was like Sondheim with his lyrics for West Side Story <laughs> when he was in his early 20s. Oh, my God. And he got that in because he was like friends with the Hammersteins and got to work with Bernstein so it's like so just go be friends or, with them yeah exactly <laughs> yeah it's nepotism <laughs> or getting extremely lucky and having people you know in your lives with money who like your work enough to put it on like with the six writers yeah what what keeps you motivated oh man I think writing like if you like it's just fun if you like what you're writing it's with anything that you do if you like it, you're going to be motivated to keep doing it. Yeah. And I, I would not be as motivated if I didn't have a collaborator. That's for sure. Sure. Because when in the, I mean, the year I worked with you, I wrote maybe like one piece over the whole like eight months or whatever. I was there longer, but I wrote the piece for about eight months. Um, That was like a six minute long piece. And I got a 
performance of it because it was for a ballet company and that was another connection through my sister um but like I didn't write really anything that year in part because I had just finished writing my first musical I wrote all by myself and then I was playing with like four different groups including yours <laughs> so I was sort of just spending my time playing a little more and I think one thing that um, having a collaborator and also like I've chosen to move to New York <laughs> sure does does for my motivation is it keeps me in it. I'm like in the exact place to do it. I am around people who are also doing the same thing I'm doing, who have their work that are trying to get at me. I have someone keeping me accountable, which is all I need, really. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. Um, yeah. And it's it's unfortunate in the there's no off switch like a like the normal job that's certainly difficult but i wouldn't be here if i didn't love it so uh, while you're pursuing this man what's your day look like do you have a day job <laughs> i do unfortunately <laughs> no it's fine um i mean it's it's sort of i can i'll talk more exactly about what i do but it's sort of expected that you have a survival job yeah to, to pay for you'd have you, to you yeah to, to live in new york yeah, it's yeah. it's it it is expensive out here. It's very expensive. Um at the at the my year has looked different every year that I've been here. It currently looks like teaching four days a week. I teach private lessons and I teach music theory classes at a string school, which is fun. And I've been there for three years, so that's nice. been consistent, but my schedule's been wildly different every year. Um and so that is the the base of my income. And then my other freelance stuff that I throw in during the day or when I have time is usually copy work for different composers. So that would be making full scores and parts. Like I said, you could do at a scale for a production or at a smaller scale for a workshop or just because the composer wants it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, and that is often like a connection from someone I've worked with before that will recommend me or I've been Massively lucky enough to have a mentorship with uh, Emily Grishman, who was the copyist for Come Fall in Love and has been the copyist for like over 150 Broadway shows, I think. She is like nice. the Broadway copyist, the real deal. <laughs> and I did a formal mentorship through through Maestro, which is an organization for women and non-binary people in theater. Um and I've done projects through her. I just got done doing a couple. That was by far the most challenging copy job I've done because it was a proper one through her office. Nice. And I was also trying to balance it with my teaching schedule, which was the hard part. Right. I think if I was just able to focus on that, it would have been better. But it was hard trying to do all of that in a timely manner and keep up my survival jobs <laughs> in this in this case. Um, but normally it's like a little bit of extra work, um, through composers directly. So I have like a couple that I've worked with in the previous sort of like school calendar year before this last one, I had a composer that was giving me very, very regular work. And so nice. most of my, that was most of my work cause I wasn't hardly teaching that year. And so I, my, that, that year it was pretty much all freelance like transcription work and copy work um, and like gigging and then this year it's a lot more like teaching based and I'm getting less copy work jobs but I'm still getting to gig a decent amount I it's sort of still a mix of like playing with artists and playing theater gigs I'd like to play more theater gigs but those are harder to <laughs> yeah get and keep consistent um, versus playing for an artist yeah so it's and I, I have Friday right now as my like carved out day that is meant for writing when I really try and like prioritize that. Um, but then that often means that on Saturday and Sunday, I end up doing any trickle over <laughs> work that inevitably happens. And I need to get better about making sure that doesn't happen mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can have a day off, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> Or any but, other. Any well, other yeah. I mean, I've I've hustled, but this is I mean, this is hustle. It's <laughs> what you're doing is real hustle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have one last question for you. She's, you know, it's it's been an hour already. I My know. Goodness, I know. Fast. Um, so, you know, you know what zeitgeist means, right? 
Uh, I believe so. But you've reminded me a couple times after I forgot. <laughs> so zeitgeist means like spirit of the times, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like what it feels like to be alive at an, in an era. Um, and since this is a musical show and I'm all about music, um, and I've had this for myself where like through music, I will feel very connected. I'll just like click in to... Mm-hmm. And what's cool for me is it can be the zeitgeist that I'm currently in. Or if I'm like, you know, learning something about, you know, music history, I can like just it comes alive in a way through music for me that um, that makes it very real. So um, there's a moment I call like a zeitgeist moment where that where you just like get it. You just kind of feel like connected through music to like Mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. Um, What were some recent zeitgeist moments for you? Or one that was um, particularly memorable? Yeah, I don't I don't think it was it's not necessarily recent, but it was but while I was in, in school, um one thing that I love about the program I went to at NYU is they really encourage everyone to find their own individual voice. And there are some other programs that don't encourage that as much. Um and so the couple of moments I've had that felt like, okay, this is this is what what musical theater is gonna look like is hearing my friend's work and hearing how inventive it was and hearing how exciting it was and how it was exploring things that I've never heard before and trying new things musically that I never heard before and I think one show that is sort of an example of like a great direction musical theater is going in is Hades Town. I saw so, that show it's so oh my inventive. god it's so it's, good it's so incredible musically and dramatically and just yeah. like in the staging, like it it does things that I've not seen a show do ever. Yeah. And it's also not like a favorite musical of mine. I like it a lot. And, and I think I, I like it because I recognize how much it's doing for the genre versus if I may be critical, a show like Dear Evan Hansen, <laughs> which tries its best to do something like productive for the culture and have fun music but ultimately becomes lackluster when you're trying to compare it with an actual piece of art like Hades Town. <laughs> um but I feel like I there was one day uh we had an assignment to all write songs for puppets. Cute. And one 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 fun thing about puppets is it really like somehow pulls at your emotions way more than people. <laughs> And so there were there there were like songs about a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly and like his friends not recognizing him anymore. Oh. And like uh I did like a shadow puppet song about like sort of a, a folk song about getting your heart broken and like traversing across the earth to find that piece of your heart that you lost. And like <laughs> just the the amount of like creativity that came out of like my friends that day and like just heart and care for the work that they've done not only in writing songs and making the puppets <laughs> was like was was really like a transformative day and to me felt a lot like the the people around my age if we are you know given opportunities as we continue to make art um will be what it looks like and can hopefully show people that it doesn't have to look like this one thing or sound like this one thing uh, and i think the there is certainly that image or future at stake with how much there's the corporatism of musicals happening like with like jukebox musicals shows with existing music happening or just like existing ip like movies um just that it's there's not as much of a chance being taken on mm-hmm. original shows, um, but there's so much incredible original work happening. <laughs> yes. And that every time I see a little bit of it, it just like reinvigorates everything. I love it. Oh, Brooke, thank you so much for being on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Zeitgeist Radio. If you'd like to take the next step in your musical journey, head over to zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio for my free course to help you figure out if you have a good voice. You can also check out my online course on the basics of singing, Discover Your Voice, made especially for introverted women. 
Music for this episode was created by Ian Boswell. Please hit that subscribe button and tell all your friends you found a cool new podcast. See you next time.